Welcome to the State of Developer Education, a podcast by Major League Hacking. We explore how technical leaders are creatively tackling the developer education gap to help prepare the next generation of technologists for the real world and build businesses that can adapt to any changes in the technology ecosystem. I'm your host, John Gottfried. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the State of Developer Education. I am so excited for this week's episode with Jemaya Sias, who is the Senior Director of Developer Relations at New Relic. Uh, how's it going today? Hey, John. Doing pretty well. Uh, super excited to join you, uh, and I hope everyone out there enjoys this episode. Uh, how about yourself? Doing pretty good, man. I, I'm really excited to hear uh, more about the work you've been doing. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to share. I start every episode um, by asking people about their origin stories. Like, how did you actually get into tech? How did you end up, you know, where you are now? You know, what was sort of the the zigzaggy path that a lot of us have to uh, get in the start of our careers? Yeah, sure. I'll be happy to share. Uh, I think mine has lots of zigs and zags and pivots in there. It's been a very interesting, non-traditional one. Um, so I originally wanted to do um like media arts so when i was younger i saw shrek for the first time completely fell in love with uh 3d animation from that point i mean i've seen other movies before but it was something about shrek that was like yeah this is what i'm gonna do and i had always been into art um before that so i went to school for 3d um 3d animation and communications and learned how to do all the things like modeling, design. Um, I was pursuing a career um, in in uh, like background and atmosphere development is what I wanted to do. So mainly building out the environments more so than characters and rigging. Um, did the whole thing and graduated in the first Great Depression, you know, like <laughs> in the housing market crash and all the things. There was no jobs, especially in Miami, where I'm from, uh, especially for that industry. Um, and it was like, oh, okay, great. I have a degree that I can't necessarily use right now. And I was having a kid at the moment. And it was like lots of things to figure out. But um, in undergrad, uh, I took an elective where we had to learn like flash animation. And so I taught myself how to build like websites using Flash, so like really cool interactive sites. Uh, this is before, you know, the Apple ecosystem came and killed Flash. Um, so that was like my first introduction to like web design and development. And also when you're learning 3D modeling and animation, uh, I was using Maya at the time. It's like industry standard software uh in order to control let's say uh sprites or the environment the way fabric flows and things uh, like that there's a scripting language in in the program that you have to learn it's a c-based language so it would be like learning c or php or a lot of the other uh, programming languages and so right at around graduation when figuring out i was not going to get a job <laughs> uh, in, in in this industry not right now at least um so all right i i really enjoyed those aspects i thought building for web was cool and i needed to pivot so it's just like that's what i'm gonna do right and so just started staying up very late at night like i would go to work um and then come home and step late and i just taught myself uh how to build like robust flash websites and then had to figure out like, okay well you have to embed this into something for it to show on the web so then learned HTML and HTML is very ugly. So I learned CSS and then I started taking jobs and realizing that I got my first uh, like 50 page site that I needed to redo or, or, or update. And then to update 50 pages with HTML and CSS was just terrible. I was like, what the hell is happening? I'm sorry for the language also. It was like, what in the world, right? Um, and so I was like, there has to be a better way you know, Google and just teaching myself or whatever. Um, so I learned that, oh, I could learn this thing called PHP that looks like the thing that's in Maya um, and I can build templating systems. And so I started teaching myself PHP so I didn't have to, you know, I can build, you know, navigation templates and things like that to make doing some of this work easier. Um, I just kind of rolled with everything as I came to a barrier to teach myself something new and really started enjoying the work. 
Uh, eventually went back and did a master's degree focused in uh, marketing for um, marketing, uh, internet marketing. So learning PPC, SEO, SEM, started working at marketing agencies, uh, advertising agencies, focusing on web. So doing a ton of front end development um, and just continuing like this this journey of like trying to learn as much as possible, mainly because of not feeling good enough at the same time to like really go for the, I am a software engineer, or I'm a developer job. So marketing felt comfortable um, and I was doing the work that I enjoyed, but I had a lot of, you know, I'm not a real software engineer in me at this moment. So just trying to learn as much as I can. And then that took me through PHP into JavaScript, and then eventually I did the Harvard CS50 uh, program that uh, where you start working in C uh, initially to learn logic, and then uh, after you worked in PHP, so that felt familiar. Um, and then at the end of the program, there was like a .NET track and a JavaScript, like a full stack JavaScript track. Um, you're supposed to choose one, but I wanted to do both. So I, I like to punish myself. I think that's why I stuck with PHP for so long, but I did both tracks and it was just a love for the work that I was doing and wanting to know more at this point. Um, after a while, I was just like, man, you know, I could, I could do this. I can understand this. It was when I started to understand computer science jokes. Like you see a thing, like, oh, I get that. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I'm really uh, uh, getting used to this. And that's when I started the decision of like, okay, well, I'm actually going to just go and be the the full stack engineer at this point. And uh, it was a journey, you know, it was not a a traditional any way, shape or form. Lots of learning, lots of late nights. Um, Started with buying the dollar books at the campus library, like the expired two additional books into the lynda.coms and YouTubes and, you know, just figuring it out as it as it uh, goes along. And after a while, I ended up being this engineer for a telecommunications company where we were building IVRs. We're actually helping uh, Twilio launch their fax API, one of the like early adopters of that. And um, I had started a developers group in Miami. Um, you know, I was doing most of his journey alone, like staying up late at night after work and then eventually uh, like being at a co-working space until 10, 11 p.m. midnight some nights just because you have to do your day job and then I still want to learn and feel comfortable. Um, and so just there trying to to figure out how I can close these gaps that I felt existed. And then uh, folks recognize like, man, you're always here. And I was like, yeah, I'm trying to get better, trying to you know actually pursue this thing that I want, like this career that I'm really passionate about. And um, it just started naturally happening of like, oh, okay, well, building this group of people that we just do that on weekends and that night, we just come and study together and help each other with projects and learning, you know, pub sub and random things, you know. Um, And so we started this group for people of color in Miami that wanted to get into tech and um, started growing that for about a year. It started with two people and uh, ended up somewhere around 100, like towards the end uh, when I I ended up leaving Miami for my role at New Relic, we were still office centric back then. So I took the role um, at New Relic and then moved to Portland. And so handed off like, you know, the reins of this this community group to others. But it was a, a, a very um, fun, I, I think, is the word experience when I look back on it all, like going from the love of design and animation into teaching myself how to code and then going from the coder to what feels like I'm I'm a software developer. I can actually build out uh, programs that that are functional and, and people would want to use. It's just you know the 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 growth over the years. Um, I'm pretty I'm pretty proud of. Like I still have those moments of you know imposter syndrome kicking in because I didn't do the CS degree, but that's my story. That, that's great. And you know it's interesting. Like I feel like in DevRel specifically more people have very non-traditional paths. You know, like if you go to the average like engineering team, a lot of people have CS degrees. They went like college to industry to that job. But Mm -hmm. in DevRel, it seems like people have a lot more, you know, 
ways of getting there, maybe because there's no degree in DevRel, right? It's like such a combination of different disciplines. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things I saw uh, when I was kind of like doing some background on you is that you started at New Relic as a PM, like a product mm -hmm. manager, and then transitioned into DevRel. Um, I know a handful of people who have gone the other way, where they started in DevRel and then went into product. Um, how did that like switch happen? And, you know, I'd be really curious to hear about like the similarities and differences between those disciplines. So my role as PM at New Relic, it was focused on our programmability functionality um, and taking that to market. Uh, but a lot of the work that I was doing even back then was still so community centric, right? Like I would uh, build out engagements for our customers, trying to expedite like the adoption of this product. So all of the training uh, materials, leading workshops, flying and giving talks and doing all these things. I think so a non-traditional PM in the sense of before I joined New Relic, I was writing software and I'm taking this product out that's truly meant for developers, right? The, the feature was being able to use React to build custom visualizations on top of the platform. And so I was like, oh, I know how to do this and I'm going to do it. And I think because of the way that I was operating as a PM, the pivot to DevRel just made a lot of sense and it, it, it didn't uh, feel like there was a disconnection there. So when I um, transitioned over into leading our DevRel org, it was like a culmination of taking some of the work that I was already doing in product um, and different you know pockets of people around the organization that were doing developer evangelism and advocacy. And I think in DevRel we have this like there's develop relations and then dev advocacy and dev evangelism and technical evangelism so many things where the works similar but for some reason it has different titles so for us it was like taking all of these folks that were trying to make this impact for our customers and advocating for observability as a key practice but also making sure that we can reduce friction points for a user that's coming into the platform or assist our large accounts in accomplishing their goals. And then we created the, the second version of our DevRel org that way. Um, and with me, I think having the, the engineering experience and then being the PM originally at New Relic was just tying a lot of you know what I've done in the past into what was needed in order to make this version of DevRel within the company um, as successful as as I I think I could have made it. One of the things I've seen that you you gave a couple of talks about, and I know it's sort of like fundamental to how DevRel works at New Relic, is the idea of like the crossover between you know engineering and like things like DevOps, SRE, observability, which at times have been different disciplines in engineering mm -hmm. orgs, but obviously in the work you guys do. Uh, there's a lot of crossover. Um, I'd love to hear more about like what you've seen in terms of developers learning those skills. Like how does a developer, you know, maybe who's only ever done web dev learn observability and, you know, more operations and systems type work? So I think as a practice, observability, uh, DevOps, SRE, like this whole, the, the focus of not only do I build the software, but I also need to understand how it operates and improving the performance of it and security now as well. Like more of those concerns are being, you know, put on the engineering teams themselves. Like I think the days of uh, software developers not having to worry about those things are coming to a close and in some organizations they're completely gone. So that's where some of the context for those types of talks are, are coming from from when I, I create them. It's, hey, you know, let's let's talk about what this looks like or what the future of software development and ownership could look like. But I think as far as like learning those those uh, practices, I always advocate for getting hands on like the way that you really learn a thing is to actually go and do it, tinker with it. Uh, create a ton of throwaway projects, right? I'm just going to build this little simple app, instrument it, or learn how to do uh, the specific type of design pattern. And it's not anything super important. I'm not going to have it long living in my GitHub repo for people to look at, but I can take that practice and apply it somewhere else. And I think for developers that are starting to have um, like the operations concerns, whether it's applying observability or becoming more of a DevOps organization, 
it's it's starting with the fundamentals, right? Um, and I think YouTube is is everyone's go to, right? Like it starts with looking at the YouTube videos, trying to apply some of that stuff, and then from there you can see that there are folks that are going into like some of the certifications that are offered, like the AWS DevOps uh, certifications and things that are a bit more structured and and um, not necessarily really traditional, but certifications are a bit more traditional than learning from something like uh, YouTube. Um, and then it's just starting to implement it in their work over uh, um, uh, given sprints, depending on what they're trying to do. Um, and then for organizations like New Relic and others that are, are focused on things like observability, it's our learning resources need to be up to par with explaining why you would do this, how it add values to the work and the easiest ways to get started, then taking them through some of like the maturity processes. And so we try to do that in our docs and our developer sites and the content that we create on the blog and other external channels as um, a supplement of someone that's just getting started. It's going to start with a Google search and we're not going to be the like the YouTube, right? Like we're going to they're going to start there and start exploring there. But once you really need to get into the nitty gritty details and the implementation, having that official documentation or hands on guide that you can walk through or even uh, like a new relic university that we maintain these kind of like self paced classes are going to be the key to then being able to fully adopt them. And I'd say that's what the path looks like currently for folks that are just learning of observability. What are some of the concepts that um, people coming from more of like a engineering or developer, you know, background struggle with with observability? I think most people you're going to get started and just trying to understand like what do I really need to be paying attention to, right? And so the introduction to observability or monitoring is the golden metrics, right? So understanding your key metrics like uh, response time, error rates. Things like that are just important out of the gate. And that's the easiest way to, to get started with it. Then folks, I think from there would go into um, figuring out how to monitor their infrastructure or uh, alerts, but you start putting alerts everywhere, right? And you have all this noise. Um, I think everything with, with learning observability is like you get started and you have to mature it. So you start with a ton of alerts and then eventually you start stripping things out and get into just having the right amount of, of, of noise that's going to really let you know when you need to pay attention to something before you get like alert fatigue and just stop paying attention. But as you start to mature, you pick up these concepts of like, uh, you get into like service levels and that's, that's you know, a bit further in the maturity curve. Uh, you try to start going from being uh, reactive into proactive and that's further down the path. Like you have to do a lot of those initial steps of just understanding golden signals, understanding the baseline of your your performance in your application before you can get into some of those later concepts. Um, you start doing things like figuring out if and when you need custom instrumentation, what data do you really need to, to, to have in order to see what the impact of your, your software is, let's say, on the company itself. So as you're going through this journey, like from getting started into applying some of those more advanced techniques, it's just um, as a developer, you start grasping some of the gaps in, in information that you need, and then you start to close those gaps so you could do more advanced techniques, right? So if I'm just uh, instrumenting and I haven't done anything, let's say, with adding uh, attributes that are important to my team or my organization, I'll never really be able to answer questions like, if I have e-commerce site that's gone down, I, and I don't have details of like, you know, specific locations or maybe the shopping cart totals. I can't correlate that to like business impact or things that other folks would, would want to understand when I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and so you just kind of like learn what's really needed, what data is really needed over time. I started kind of similarly to you. Like I have a history degree. I was a self-taught developer. Like I did a lot of like web dev work kind of largely in php as well um and i remember a lot of the teams and projects i was working on you know i would be the only developer or one of two developers and 
you know, you're inherently responsible for deploying and, you know, keeping the site up and like all of those different things. Um, and I would imagine that like, when you think about like developers as a cohort, it's probably some kind of bell curve of who cares about deliverability and ops, right? Like the people yeah. on really small sites really care about it because they're the only ones responsible for it. All the people in the middle on these huge engineering teams might be a little bit abstracted away from it. And then when you're really advanced, you probably care about it a lot. And I would guess that like, you know, some of the work is moving that window, you know, further towards the middle where more developers touch, you know, metrics and observability and uptime as a way to improve their, the quality of their software, right? At the end of the day. Yeah, it, that makes a ton of sense. And I think you're absolutely correct. Um, and and also it, it depends on the organization that you, that you're starting to work in. Uh, you have some companies where it truly is like your team builds it and they they you own it and you're responsible for its operation and understanding its performance. And in in those models, it's extremely important for you to just understand what's going on and why. Um, and so you're you're absolutely correct. Like in the beginning, when you're the only person that that's kind of like building and maintaining the service. You're fully responsible for everything. You have to learn how to deploy it. When something goes down, you're responsible for figuring out what happened and how to, you know, not have that incident repeat itself. Um, and then you you move into these larger orgs, and you might have a DevOps or an SRE team, and they're kind of like a bit more focused on the performance or the operation side. So it's a bit more abstracted. But I think in the last few years, I've seen that that's been changing a lot, right? Like a lot of organizations are wanting to become more of like a DevOps org or DevSecOps org. And that's actually putting more concern on the developers, right? From an operations and a security standpoint. Um, so I think it's overall, like having at least a bit of the foundational knowledge is, is you know, important for, for developers these days. And then as you become more kind of like advanced and really own some of these services, it's gonna be more important for you to really understand um, some of like the the key metrics of the, the, the software that you're operating and what its performance and production looks like and being able to talk through that with leaders, right? Like once you start having those conversations. Yeah, I definitely wish something like New Relic existed when I was like at that stage of my career because the pinnacle of observability for me was like getting a log emailed to me once a day, you know, like like that was kind of the best I could do uh, when I was learning the code. Yeah, I remember at one point um, I was I tell the story. It's like I was uh, working at a company and we would know that our site was down, like if people started shouting at us on Twitter and the idea of like operating that way versus having something that's kind of like watching, you know, uh, your software for you that can alert you if, if something happens and allow you to address it a lot quicker is going to be the difference in, you know, user satisfaction and and the the scale and growth of that company as well, right? So, I, I agree. Like, it would have been a good tool for me to have when I was just getting started. Outside of New Relic, I know you've done uh, a good amount of work. Um teaching people to code yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Like with different boot camps, with the meetups you were running. Um, I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that experience because I, I think I've often found that one of the best ways to learn and really hone my own skills is by teaching other people similar concepts. Um, so how did that start? And sort of what was the process like of, of actually like teaching people to code from zero? exactly what you said right one of the best ways to learn for me is to also kind of like teach and speak through things um so it kind of came uh in those days of just being up and trying to close like those gaps that i felt that i had in my skill set so a lot of learning on my end and then eventually working with people and taking on projects working on like open source community projects in miami um, as needed uh, from a group level, we started doing uh, what we would call shut up and code. So uh, we would be at a CIC, which is like a co-working space um, in, in Miami. And at least monthly, we'd have these, these meetups where it's just like, all right, we'll bring your project ideas. And we're just going to sit and work on them together, right? Or if you have something that you're working on and you don't really want to be bothered, but you want to be in a room with other people, like, 
come to shut up and code. And that was the the first iteration of like actually teaching because you're hashing out ideas. We're on the whiteboard. We're mapping things out like you could come and say, hey, I want to build a new portfolio site that's going to help me get this thing. And we just map it all out. Like, All right. What do you need to do about yourself? Let's look at LinkedIn. Let's look at, you know, this and that. Um, we look at um, the companies that people wanted to work for and try to work backwards for like the skill sets that you need to have. and then eventually that rolled into i think folks realizing like oh you know they're doing all of these things like they're actually having uh some impact on the 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 group of people that are attending on a regular basis and i was provided an opportunity to um first uh assist with like the the cs program that that was happening at miami dade um and so just providing insight and helping folks with their P sets uh, as a part of their their various cohorts. And then an opportunity to teach um, like a coding boot camp through the summer for high school students. And I, the, when the opportunity came, it was just like, this is an amazing you know program. They got a group of students from various high schools, uh, put them in the summer program. They were gonna teach them how to code, Photoshop, uh, I think music production, like different uh, courses they could choose throughout the summer. And then they had like a capstone project where they would build a website for a local business or do something that they learned through the summer for a local business for a stipend at the end of the summer. And so I taught the uh, web development uh, boot camp there uh, where it was you know, from scratch. So starting with HTML and CSS and then going into JavaScript, mainly trying to teach them how to go from a blank screen into a functioning, you know, site, a five single five page site. It could be uh, for a restaurant or something like that, giving them enough leeway to work towards what their their capstone project would be. Um, and it was over the course, I think, of eight weeks. I just really enjoyed it. I thought it was great. Like working with those students was amazing. Seeing, you know, some of them go from never doing anything of the sort, right? So never building a website or understanding anything about uh, development into creating some really cool projects and being super passionate about it at the end of the day. They're like, I'm going to go to college for this, you know, like that. That was like pretty cool. Um, and then from there, I only did the the high school boot camp once, but then uh, started to partner with the with various cities in Miami and doing a similar version of that boot camp, but for citizens of like that local community. So either city of Miami, city of North Miami, and uh, running an eight week program where the residents within that city can come and learn how to code and build projects. And it was the same experience, but. Um, then instead of it just being students, it would be, you know, some younger kind of like uh, folks, like some students, and then some like older, like almost my dad's age, you know, coming in and they're just learning to turn the computer on or I sign, help them sign up for their first email account. Right. And it's like, it was a challenge of like, how do you go from you've never created an email account to I'm going to learn how to write code. But, um, over the course of like those programs, you'd have some folks that would leave because it was just a, a little bit too much, but we have a lot of people that would stay and you just see this growth. Um, and then you'd have people that start freelancing and starting businesses and marketing agents, like small marketing agencies afterwards. So I, I felt like it was like really good for the soul <laughs> and uh, for me and doing some of this, but it also gave me kind of um, the opportunity to grow uh, my skill set by having to teach like some of these concepts, um, especially getting into JavaScript as as like, you know, a part of those programs. It was always sticky at that point, like um, the HTML and the CSS. It was a challenge, but things got real when it was like, oh, OK, now we're going to actually make that button work. And here's a whole a whole new world of concerns. Uh, but that's that's how that went um and it's something that i actually would do you know more of uh now i think at this point in my career if i had you know more time on the side to work or at least come in and and uh maybe do like a pop-up session or something like that what was like 
the light bulb moment for your students. Like I, like I also get to watch a lot of people learn to code for the first time. And there are certain concepts that like really stick and get people excited. Like what did you see when you were working with, you know, these different groups of people? So I would try to give them like their first win as, as quickly as possible. So like the first day of class, you know, going through um, the concepts, mainly starting like with HTML, so teaching the structure and then how to make things look better. And so what I would do is explain kind of like the basics of HTML and I'd have them follow along and writing some things out for me. Um, and I just create a really simple two page kind of like site of like, all right, we're gonna create two pages and you could, once they could see, like from the code to the browser, even though it's just a simple header, some text and a link, and you can click it and go to the other page. I think that was like the, oh my God, you know, moment. And I try to get there in day one and explain it in the sense of like, you just created your first website because realistically you have, it doesn't, it doesn't do much. It's not going to be, you know, this life-changing uh, application that will turn into a unicorn or anything. But at this point, you are a web developer. And now let's see how we can grow this skill set over the next eight weeks. So that was the the first thing I would do to kind of like get people really amped up and interesting. And then I try to plan that experience in different parts of the course. So like from that first web page, and then I wouldn't really focus on a really big win for a while. Like, let's just get the core concept of uh, HTML down. And then for CSS, I would try to get another like, this all looked terrible, but now we're going to figure out how to make it look better. Right. And that was another big like, oh, my God, this looks so much better. I added an image and you know, I can control colors and I try to plan it out that way. So with each uh, language, it just kind of like builds on the excitement and what you can do now. And um, I always use the analogy of like, we're building a house, right? So, you know, um, I would say like the URL is like your address. And so the HTML, we're laying down the foundation and the CSS is we're painting it. And now we're going to do JavaScript and that's going to be the electrical and the plumbing. And it's going to give you like this functionality and make your house come to life. So I try to, you know, amp it up that way. But for each new thing that I would introduce, it's just try to get them to a win in that moment and allow them to see why it's so important to learn this new, a bit more complicated <laughs> uh, uh, part of, of the course. And I thought that it, it would help with folks getting through like some of the imposter syndrome, some of the challenges of, of, uh, wanting to maybe drop out of like oh you know it's too hard and and that's kind of like how i went about it it's um i, I think it's how i i did it for myself as well yeah how has that experience of teaching you know beginners influenced how you think about like developer content and training at new relic yeah i think it taught me that you really have to know how to break things down in a way that's understandable um, it also helped me learn how to make less assumptions, right? Like, I think sometimes when we're thinking about a seasoned uh, software engineer, you you assume that, you know, they know everything. And that, and that might be true, but uh, the, the better that you can remove some of the assumptions that you're making in creating like educational content, um and provide more background more resources um and opportunities to where they could jump forward if they need to but you know really getting into kind of like the details and making sure that the value's there um i think i learned a lot of that from um from having to teach a beginner right like a person that doesn't even have an email account or has never you know seen source code before um, that's one thing that that absolutely has helped um, uh, with creating like educational content for New Relic, um, and it's also given me this skill set of like being at least open with with you know what I'm assuming. Like in this piece of content, we're going to assume that you understand these key concepts, and this is what you're going to take away. So the way that I'm going to frame it is just putting everything uh, right out there. I'm going to front load the conversation, and then if you 
haven't, here's some links to help you get started or here's some resources that you can, you know, refer to. I think I got most of that from just having to uh, either remember what it was like for myself or in working with folks that are just getting started. And sometimes I'm going into concepts as well. So I have to teach myself in order to teach others. And that's what I would be, you know, looking for. Yeah, it's it's kind of like a choose your own adventure model of like onboarding into a product, right? Like maybe I need to learn what observability is. Maybe someone yeah. else knows exactly what it is and just wants to know how to implement it. Even if I know what a concept is, I could be thinking about it, you know, a, a bit differently in that moment. And so sometimes it's just good to level set, right? So in the context of this conversation, this is, you know, what observability is or what a concept is. And um, I try to do that as as a norm. I, I saw something you uh, wrote recently or maybe spoke about um about AI in, in mm-hmm. observability. And that, that seems to be like the topic that everyone's talking yeah. about these days. I've talked to a lot of DevRel people about it. I've talked to, you know, some folks who are building AI tooling. Um, how does it play into your world? I feel like it's it's playing in, in in various capacities, right? There's Jemaya, like the 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 human and then the IC work that I do and then having to lead the the teams that I lead. And so you can, AI is everywhere, right? Like it's, it's the way that it's impacting the world. I don't think we've seen since the iPhone, you know, like it's, it's effectively changing the way that we think about things and how we interact with technology. And so I think from the human side, it's just me paying attention to all this that's going on and try to figure out how it's going to impact, not just me, but just like the world, right. And the way that we consume information is changing like even thinking about this conversation with the state of developer education uh when i taught myself how to code it was very late nights having to go to a library or a bookstore sitting in a barnes and nobles to read through various books and try to find the one that i think that's going to be the most helpful and lynda.com and then youtube and kind of like the growth of the way that you could teach yourself and now you can just go on chat gpt and say hey, teach me how to deploy a Kubernetes cluster uh, into AWS with, uh, you know, it's, it's and, and it's going to give you that insight. Of course, you have to take some of it with a grain of salt because of the, the knowledge gap that it has for, um, you know, the last two years, but it could get you started in a way that's more custom to what you need to learn in that moment. And you can tell it to build an educational plan and find your resources. So the way that you can actually teach yourself with AI is it, it has so much power to change not only like the technological, the tech, uh, technological landscape, but also just education in general. And I have a 17 year old daughter and I can see it at her school where it's just like, how do we stop kids from using this? How do we teach them to take advantage of it? And, you know, so I I look at it from that standpoint, then um, I think as like an employee or professional in tech, I I see the concerns that people have of like, oh, AI is gonna take all of our jobs away or we shouldn't be using AI for this at this moment, it's unethical. And all of those conversations that are happening, I think everyone's just trying to figure out how to, leverage kind of like this new really exciting technology but in a way that's ethical and and can still have like impact on scaling your velocity or scaling like your understanding of the work that you're doing things like copilot with github or or other uh providers now you know some of the most uh uh uh, impactful software developers aren't even writing their own code you know anymore like they're using copilot to speed up their development process and then filling in gaps so I'm kind of like watching and learning. Uh, I think that it's pretty exciting. Uh, I've gone through the process of teaching myself once again, right? Like how do I learn how to work with something like OpenAI? How do I create embeddings? What's a vector database? Let me actually create one and see, you know, so it's like I'm now in that exploratory phase of like, let me learn and and grow my skill set and in and how do I work with this technology to see how it can be applied into things uh, that I'm already doing at work, either from a team level of one of our concerns is uh, content, 
uh, another one is engineering. So should we, should it be okay for us to use Copilot like on our engineering teams? And, you know, answering some of those questions require you to actually use it and, and see uh, the true value in it. So I'm, I'm at that phase now. Um, and then also like from a company standpoint, we're looking at how do we use AI to improve our customer experience, right? So we're building uh, AI assistant, New Relic Rock, that's gonna allow our customers to then interact with observability in a way that's more natural to them, right? So instead of having to go in and find the alert or charts or dashboards, we're saying, how could we take this idea of, of generative AI, right? Like chat GPT that everyone went crazy over and just allow people to come in and say, I see a spike in traffic, what's going on? And then in the end, it's saying, okay, well, we see that this service has been interrupted and it's correlated to this thing in your infrastructure. And here's a bit of your code that has an error in it. And where it normally would have required, you know, um, an advanced skill set in using these tools, anyone can go and do it at that standpoint. And I think that's that's what I see AI doing to the world is that it's providing information to folks that it's lowering the barrier to entry. If you if you want to kind of like teach yourself a thing or learn something, the barrier to entry is so much lower, like uh, with with what's going on now with uh, just Gen AI. It's really good at synthesizing information and digging stuff up for you. And I think especially for learners, um, even if you don't know what concept you are describing, if you can describe it in layman's terms, it can probably tell you what you're looking for. And that's like really powerful. You know, if I go to you, I'm like, oh, I really want to know like, how to know when my app goes down, you know, like I might not even know the word observability, but it might be able to point me in the right direction. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And so I think that's that, that, that barrier that, that folks will have removed. Um, I also see it. I also see in the near future, there's going to be just kind of like a ton of folks that are starting to create new applications and new products because it's reducing like the need for me to learn how to build a thing, right? I could have AI create it for me. Um, and so I do think that it's gonna then introduce performance as a key concern, right? It's like, because now the barrier to entry of creating applications and services are a lot lower, right? I could build an app in natural language and allow a tool to write all of the code for me. Um, I, I don't necessarily understand, you know, what, what's been written or how it's operating or, or what's actually being done. Um, so I'm going to need to be a bit more in line with then learning what, you know, not it, I don't want to say like observability, but just application performance at that point, like how to keep it up and running, how to know if it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and I think that I've seen like a few reports that are saying the same thing, right? Like in the near future, AI observability, as well as governance and a lot of the other things that we have to think about is going to be so important just because of how, how it's expediting, you know, creation. So I always have a couple of questions I like to end on with people. Uh, you've mentioned YouTube a couple of times. You've mentioned, you know, lynda.com, all these resources that you leverage. Um, are there any like tech educators, creators, you know, people working on documentation um, that you really like look up to these days and follow? Yeah, I think from, from a company standpoint, it'd be easier. Uh, I think the way that I operate, I'm like consuming information, but not making like personal connections. I think the one name is like, oh, you know, I follow all of the Uncle Bob stuff and try to make sure that I'm writing like clean software. Um, I still use some of the services like um, Udacity's and Udemy's. I still buy courses all the time and go through them when I'm teaching myself. Um, I actually have been a fan of like what MLH has been doing as well as um, uh, uh, Free Code Camp 
was one that I enjoy and I, I will go watch their videos all the time, uh, even like creating some content with them in the past. I think there are, you know, amazing resources and organizations out there. It's just so many of them uh, that it's hard to at like a person level call out specific creators, but there are some like organizations that I know for a fact are like making real impact, especially for folks that are coming in and just getting started, right? Like, um, I had the opportunity to work with like code.org in the past and just what they're doing for kids. I remember like going through their stuff with my daughter and getting her her brought in a lot earlier. I think like orgs like that are so important from for the youth and then for, you know, uh, folks that are a bit older, it's going to be the programs and and like it's going to be the free code camps. It's going to be the major league hacking. It's going to be some of like uh, these boot camps that are just really helping you transition your careers that are just so crucial in order for us to to kind of like get to that goal that we set for ourselves. I appreciate the kind words and I, and I agree. Like there's such a wealth of resources right now and it's really cool to see that like so many of them are free and accessible for anyone who can get access to a computer you know um the the question i like to end on which is kind of just like a, a funny curiosity thing I, i'm always asking people is is there anyone that like you look up to in tech or science or teaching that you would love to like grab for a couple hours for lunch and just like pick their brain about how they do what they do one person that I would look up to and just kind of like follow on Twitter was uh, Kelsey Hightower. Like he was a uh, really just passionate about like uh, tech in general, always exploring and tinkering. I got lucky to actually start to uh, interact with him a bit, like in the last few years. Um, so that would have been the first person that I called out and that's probably like the, the the biggest person out of like, hey, let's sit down and, you know, mm -hmm. just kind of like chat and see how do you, how, how could I learn some of like what you have going on? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah he, he's really um, kind of like one of those aspirational figures in DevRel, especially that I've followed for a long time. So I, yeah, I hear that. I'd love to meet him and talk to him one day. Uh, who Who's your person? Oh man. Um <laughs> that's a funny question. I uh honestly I would love to like sit down with Waz one day. Um mm -hmm. like I find the way he approaches technology and like the industry in general really interesting. Um and I find it really really cool that he basically became like a middle school CS teacher after, you know, making a ton of money on Apple. Uh, and so the whole like idea of how he views the world and tinkering, I've I've always found super interesting. Oh yeah, that's 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 a really good choice. I I got to hear Waz talk like maybe two years ago. It's just like it was just so fascinating, right? Like the the way that you know uh, he thinks through things and they hear his journey. So I could see how having kind of like a private conversation would be pretty cool. Like it's just, it's just like. You know, this is like pretty awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I think so. Um, thank you so much for your time, uh, Jemaya. I really appreciate everything you shared and, and all the insights that you had. Um, we'll include some links for people to find you online if they want to see what you're up to. But uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode and uh, definitely you know, subscribe for more soon. And uh, happy hacking, everyone. Thanks, John. Bye, everyone. The State of Developer Education is brought to you by Major League Hacking. To find out more about Major League Hacking and how we're educating the next generation of developers and helping the world's leading companies reach them, visit sponsor.mlh.io. And make sure to search for Developer Education in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else you listen, and click like and subscribe so that you don't miss any future episodes. And if you like it, please don't forget to leave a review and we'll give you a shout out on a future podcast. On behalf of the team here at Major League Hacking, thanks for listening and helping us empower the next generation of technologists. Happy hacking.